Welcome everyone that just joined. We'll just uh, be waiting a few more minutes so that everyone can join and we'll be starting soon. Okay, we are going to get started now. Welcome everyone. Um, hope everyone's having a beautiful Saturday um, here in the UK, still 5 p.m. So we still have a, a little bit of the evening, but uh, back in Africa is already night. So um, good night for everyone as well, um, <laughs> depending on where you are in the world. Um, so just a huge welcome from Phoenix Method. First of all, just some housekeeping rules. Um, everyone came into this webinar muted. Um, please stay that way so that we don't have any background noise, but feel free to turn your cameras on if you want or not. Um, but it's always good to see some familiar faces around and not know that you're not talking to a screen, uh, but do as you wish. We also um, would love to have your contributions on the chat function of this webinar. So if you have any questions throughout the whole webinar, just drop your questions there. Uh, we'll be having a Q&A session at the end where we will try to answer all of your questions. And if you also want to make some comments throughout, you know, feel free to do so as well. Uh, the chat function is there for that. Um, we're more than happy to have you here. The structure of the session is just going to be um, a little introduction to the Phoenix Meded first. And then we're gonna have our speaker, Twilika, who is going to give a presentation about learning. Um, and we're gonna be learning about her experiences and also how to deal with student burnout, which is such an important topic nowadays. Um, so just uh, also this session is being recorded um, and it will go to our YouTube page afterwards. So. Great. Uh, just a little introduction to the Phoenix method. As you can see from this beautiful poster on uh, the screen, <laughs> Phoenix method is an international community of medical students and junior doctors from Cardiff, Namibia and Zambia's medical schools. And we were created in the beginning of the pandemic when we had plans to go to Namibia, but they were canceled because of COVID, unfortunately. But we decided to take the most out of it and we just created a group of people who are very keen on international collaboration and we have been growing massively our community since then and this group provides a unique opportunity for international fellowship and collaboration across continents while we'll also promote uh, global health education the group connects individuals um, and we always try to organize lectures and small group discussions by hosting a variety of events online and they're very educational as well. While we are a new addition to the Phoenix Project family, um, the friendships formed here will continue to strengthen uh, the Phoenix network. And we hope that also it helps us have a support network throughout our careers. So we are more than keen to have you involved in what we're doing. So please do send us a message on any of our social media platforms if you want to get involved. If you do not want to get involved, but still wants to attend uh, more of our events, just follow us on our social media pages and keep an eye on there because we'll be posting regularly about our events and details. So um, just wanted to 
share with you guys um, a little bit about our Facebook page. So uh, here, as you can see, you can press like, you know, and follow uh, our content, which we post all the time there. So including the, the details for this webinar. So you probably know our page already, uh, but make sure you give it a like so that you can continue to receive messages. We also have a, a YouTube page where we upload all of our webinars and some introduction as well about who Phoenix Meded is, like who the members are and getting to know us. So make sure you check that out. And we also have a Twitter page where we post all of the information there as well. And we interact with the medical community. So uh, today, this year, uh, this, this month, we have several events happening. Today uh, is our formal event. And we also have a social event, two social events, uh, one on the 23rd and one on the 28th of November. And um, we, we always try to host every month one formal event in the middle of the month where we have a guest speaker like today and talking about a range of uh, topics in healthcare and also for students and medical uh, doctors in training. And we also have a social, we have bun a bunch of social events towards the end of the month where we can get to know more about each other, interact, have some interesting discussions. So make sure you um, follow our Facebook and our Twitter uh, to keep up to date to these events. And we really hope that you, you join us in these because they will be completely amazing. So without any further ado, I just would like to introduce our speaker. So Twilik Andreas is a 20 year old second year medical student from the University of Namibia. She's also the Secretary of Community Development and Gender Affairs. She co-founds Dear Girl Namibia, which focuses on restoring the dignity of Namibian girls by giving them platforms and resources that can bridge the gap between them and their future goals and plans. She also co-founds Purposeful Camp Namibia, an organization aimed at peer-to-peer -peer education on areas such as personal development, leadership, public speaking, and entrepreneurship. So Twilika, we're more than happy to have you here today. Um, and the stage is all yours. I'm <laughs> very, very happy to hear from you. Thank you so much, Amanda, for that beautiful introduction. Not only for me, but for the Phoenix um, Med Ed organization as well. I am very happy to be here today. And I feel honored that I actually get to use this platform and my voice to impact the lives of fellow medical students all over the world. Because honestly, me being in Africa, I feel so far away from you guys. But things like these, platforms like this really connect us and they help us bridge those gaps. So yes, I am going to start now. I'm just quickly loading my screen. Um, awesome. All right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, once again. As I was introduced, my name is Tulika Andreas, and I will be focusing this discussion on learning and dealing with student burnout. I believe that every single one of us, when we stepped into med school, we were told that the university cares about your mental health. We were told that self-care is priority. And we were told that this school is actually the school that is actually the devil. That is what we hear most of the time about med school. We hear that it is the hell of all universities. It's for the brightest, for the strongest, and for the toughest individuals only. But ladies and gentlemen, I believe that that notation of what medical school is, is a wrong perception. I'm not saying that in itself, it's a beautiful place, but I'm saying that the fact that we spearhead this idea of what medical school is like, is actually very scary for a first year to hear on their first day of university. So why should we talk about topics like burnout? I believe that this is a topic that actually matters a lot, however, receives very little detail. Yes, we go on about mental health a lot, but we forget that mental health has different aspects to it. And one of the most extreme ones is burnout, which a lot of students actually experience knowingly and unknowingly. On the screen is a car 
burning out. I asked a couple of people what they think student burnout is, and a lot of them actually did not know. They thought I was talking about a car, because this is the only burnout that people actually know. And it's quite shocking to realize that people don't have the knowledge of these experiences that they too might actually go through. So as this car is burning out, you see smoke, you see fire, red burning fire. This is how an individual's body feels like when they're experiencing burnout. You feel smoked inside, literally feeling like you are being fried by everyday living. It's, it feels like a drag. And because of that, you lose meaning and hope in your life. Proceeding. Now, what exactly is student burnout? Student burnout is the culmination, which means um, consecutive build up of many weeks and months of studying the same material or from continuous years of schooling. This means that it's not something that just happens overnight. It's not just something that is caused by feelings of frustration that you get when you study for hours or pulling all nighters, which we are also familiar with, but it's a thing that has built up over years of studying or months of studying, which I feel is very relevant in the stage of COVID-19, where months have been actually, where we've actually been in the pandemic for months now, and we've been feeling confined in homes, feeling confined in um, environments. And so burnout is actually very susceptible in these times. It is therefore a chronic condition Yes, it is defined as a condition because it is clinically diagnosed. And it, it occurs when you actually study for a very, very long time or even do work or projects. I'm very keen on this topic because I believe I'm a multifaceted person and I am involved in a lot of things as I was introduced. And burning out is one thing that I've always been at risk of. I think the closest experience I've heard of burning out was in my matric year grade 12, where I actually traveled to the States um, in April for the whole month and came back and had to write two exams in one month, both my first term exam and my second term exam. So it was quite a very difficult time of my life, but then I had to pull through because at the end of the day, I wanted to see myself in med school. Okay, just a quick summary of what I'm going to focus on in this presentation. First of all, how do you know when you're experiencing burnout? I feel this is a question that we need to answer. Secondly, is it as dangerous as I'm making it sound right now? Or can I just get some rest and it will disappear? Thirdly, how can I prevent myself from burning out? Are there things that you can actually do to prevent that? Fourthly, what can universities and communities do in order to combat um, this burnout, in order to assist students and prevent them from actually burning out? And lastly, how has the COVID-19 pandemic influenced student efficiency? All right, let's get into it. How do you know you're experiencing burnout? I feel like these images really depict what burnout looks like. The first one shows a person who feels disconnected from themselves. You feel detached from who you want to become, who you are in the present, and even who you were in the past. It's as if you are now just going wherever the wind blows you. You have lost a sense of drive. You have lost a sense of enthusiasm and excitement for life. And all you seem to do is actually wander around, trying to get the little sleep that you can, even though you actually can't sleep, which is depicted by the second picture, where you are constantly feeling fatigued, constantly feeling tired, and trying to actually do work, but at the same time, really, really tired. And then the last image is now certainly where you are struggling to get sleep and struggling to wake up. I know this is not a rare um, feeling. I feel like it's very common in medical students. It's very common in, amongst my friends at least, because most of the time it's as if you, you want to cover as much work as you can. So you pull all night and then you drag yourself throughout the day. 
And I don't think this is how it's supposed to be. As unrealistic as eight hours of sleep seem for medical students, I do believe that sleep is essential. I do believe that rest is essential. But there are other forms of rest, of course, which I'll also go into. So when you're experiencing burnout, the cardinal signs that you can look out for is definitely feeling detached from yourself and the world feeling very tired, loss of enthusiasm, loss of fatigue, uh, loss of interest, I mean. Um, you feel as if you are just not accomplishing anything. Even though you are working really hard, you are just not getting to where you see yourself. You are not proud of the efforts you make. Everything just seems to be going down the drain for you. So these are some of the, and you even also feel very irritated and annoyed by things that people say although it's completely normal in, in actual reality. So is it dangerous or can you just get some rest and overcome it? Well, ladies and gentlemen, burnout, as I mentioned in the beginning, is a condition that can be clinically diagnosed. I personally have not been diagnosed with burnout ever, but as a medical student, we have tendencies of diagnosing ourselves. So here and there, I realized that I'm actually experiencing burnout. And one time I think was in the very beginning of COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic, during the month of June, where I constantly felt the need to stay on top of my work, where online school was becoming very demanding as compared to face-to-face, -to -face, which was quite a shock for me to realize that studying online actually requires much more input from your end, has more deadlines, and just requires you to actually be more um diligent in your work because now you now have so much free time and you try so hard to make sure that you actually consider which things should be done first so there are actually some three cardinal um, symptoms of burnout and these are intense headaches insomnia and depression Headaches come in various forms, as we all know, but I feel one of the most important headaches associated with burnout is migraines. And then insomnia, obviously the feeling of constant tiredness and just trying to sleep but not getting sleep at all. And then we have depression, of course, where you feel um, detached from the rest of the world. You feel a dark sense of unhappiness as if this cloud of darkness is following you everywhere around. And you can't seem to find happiness in anything you do. So it's important that we actually recognize these signs and symptoms of burnout and actually try and do something about them before they become our reality. All right. How then can one prevent themselves from burning out? I think one thing that I always do is take a step back. This means that I have to take a step back and evaluate where I am and just feel the presence of the moment that I'm in, take deep breaths and so on, and just try to actually exist in the moment that I'm in. I try to reflect how much work I've done, how much work I have to do, and what it is that's actually irritating me. We all have these stress triggers that we can actually identify and try to combat. One thing that I think helps is I have a list of feel goods. These are things that are easy and simple to do that actually make me happy. Could be a song, could be drinking um, something, could be eating something, could be reading a favorite passage, or could just be going out, which is actually my next point, get outside. Every time I find myself sitting for too long in my chair, I tell myself, I need to go out, I need to breathe, I need to inhale fresh air. And I know as difficult as it is in times of COVID, just to go out and socialize, it's important that we at least try to go for works and so on, just to rejuvenate our minds, to rejuvenate ourselves. The third point, set reasonable goals. As medical students, we tend, to, or just as students in general, we tend to be very competitive against ourselves and others, and this actually makes us set high unrealistic goals, especially when we are comparing ourselves to our peers. And we fail to realize that our abilities and our strengths 
might not be in line with the, the amount of work we're actually setting ourselves out to do. So it's important that we realize the kinds of methods, the kinds of techniques that can work with us in order for us to set realistic goals. And then make time for yourself. I mean, you should always be your first priority apart from everything else. So it's important that you set out time to do things that you love. If you love journaling, do that. If you love exercising, do that. If you love yoga, do that. And I feel like these are not just things you have to do on weekends, but squeeze them into your exam schedule, squeeze them into your study timetables in order for you to actually get back to yourself and not just drown yourself in work. And then rest for real this time. I feel like as medical students and personally myself, we do not know how to rest. We tell ourselves we are resting, but actually that's not what we are doing. All we do is we then move away from our books to our bed on our phones, which is actually not resting. It's again, you are using your emotional and mental energy, investing it into a technical device, investing it into talking to somebody, family and so on. Yes, you need to keep in contact with people, but sometimes you need to find ways and mechanisms that can allow you to rest your mind and body. Personally, for me, I really enjoy doing yoga because I feel like it, it really allows my body to release so much tension, especially towards the end of the day. And the next point, move your body. You are not a tree. This is one thing I always tell myself. As humans, we are not meant to be stationary at the same point the whole entire day. I remember once in my grade 12 year, I studied from morning till 5 a.m. in the evening, only stopping to go get something to eat, which is totally unhealthy and unrealistic because at the end of the day, you'll be too tired to even remember anything. So get out and do activities that help you. Um, I think at my university, it's, it's quite convenient because we have a gym, we have a swimming pool, and we have other activities as well that can actually help you. Um, release so much tension. And then remember to always manage your time. Um, yes, this is very important because we find ourselves spreading ourselves too thin. Um, we find ourselves trying to multitask when we study and actually not doing justice to any of the activities we do. So it's important that you allocate your time to what you want to do, not doing two activities at the same time. Actually, in fact, not what you want to do, what you need to do. So what is most urgent? What is most important? And obviously not forgetting rest. And definitely organize your work better. Always best to be organized than disorganized. All right. Now, what exactly can universities and communities do to prevent students from burning out? First of all, I've read up on the internet that other universities actually have a pass and fail grading system in their first and second years. I feel like if more universities, particularly medical universities, can implement this system, it cultivates a culture of um, collaboration and teamwork among students as compared to comp competition and um, intense studying in order to get on top of the class. So if my university could implement this pass and fail grading system, at least for the first two years of university, I feel students will be less compelled to be so competitive against one another and rather just focus on working hard to pass the modules. Secondly, I feel like we need to establish resiliency curriculums. These are basically curriculums way in which um, lecturers can help students set realistic goals and manage their time, teach them about all these things. Because I feel like um, I, for one, from Africa, but specifically Namibia, in high school, these things were not really emphasized. So you step into university, a new territory where you don't really have a clue about planning. You don't really have a clue about setting realistic goals. We did have a life skills class, but honestly, that was our rest class and our maybe to complete maths class. So it was never a class of, you know, learning how to actually build on these skills. So if universities can include these curriculums, it will definitely be helpful. Thirdly, stress management programs. These can be initiated by psychologists on campus where students can just go and probably do some meditation, some yoga every now and then. I feel like 
people should really invest in these activities on campuses. Um, in Africa, Namibia per se, we have so many psychologists that are unemployed. We ask ourselves, why is this? Is the market too saturated or is it that there's just no jobs for them? We just don't create jobs for them, but we actually need them in our communities. And then fourthly, mentorship programs. This year, we started a mentorship program with the medical students, way in which the second year medical students mentor the first year medical students. And honestly, I feel if I had a mentor in first year who's second year, I would have done so much better, not only um, in terms of my academics, but also in terms of my well being and, you know, just emotional well being in general, because a mentor kind of gives you some sort of direction and just helps you in um, establishing yourself and finding your grounds and you know you always have somebody to talk to who has actually been where you have been and then lastly outdoor study friendly activities uh, environment sorry i believe that these are important um, particularly in countries where we have medical campuses so that students can just go off campus and find other environments to study be it um, cafes be it a park-like environment, just something very lively, something very um, green, something that's very accommodative that um, students can study at. And then my last point, how has the COVID-19 pandemic influenced student efficiency? With the COVID-19 pandemic, we have witnessed how difficult it is to actually convert from face-to-face -face learning to online school. A lot of countries have hesitated to implement online schooling because of the, first of all, the financial gaps in societies, the social gaps, the economic gaps, all these gaps that exist have made it difficult for countries to even think of implementing it. But at the end of the day, a realization was made that we do have to continue with education. We do have to continue with training doctors, training teachers, training lawyers. So eventually online learning was implemented. My personal experience was difficult at first, but eventually I learned that there are some skills that you can actually start um, learning and some habits that you can stop doing to help you. Personally, I have learned um, that using flashcards actually helps me stay on top of my work. So I've started using flashcards. Um, those are now actually not, not um, physical flashcards, but flashcards on my laptop. And I've also learned how to minimize being too overcommitted and rather trying to um, narrow down onto things that are most important. So the first point here is being confined in environments uh, being in confined environments is generally stressful. Nobody wants to be confined in a room, confined in the same house or in the same space for too long. So it induces stress. And honestly, till today, I don't know how to um, overcome stress because I know there are some things you can do to prevent yourself from stressing out. But when you get there, it's really difficult to bounce back. So these are again things that we need to look into. How can we actually prevent ourselves from stressing out in confined environments. In Namibia particularly, it's very difficult for students to go back to their houses who have been staying in boarding schools, which has been happening. And because of this, there's been an increase in things like gender-based violence, there's been an increase in rape cases, because now students are, school has kind of been an escape for them from these situations, but now having to go back there and having to try and look for internet access to actually continue their education has been quite a problem. But thankfully to organizations like NANSO that exist in our country and also our very efficient government, we were able to ensure that most of the students actually got access. Mm -hmm. And then secondly is an increase in online deadlines. I mentioned this before. Basically what I mean by this is that online school has more deadlines than face-to-face -face learning. I don't know if I'm the only one who feels that way, but honestly, even though it's more relaxing, even though it's more um, spaced out, you get to study whenever you want to, you get to allocate subjects to whichever time you want to, it has more deadlines and you just feel so overwhelmed by everything. Probably because now you, you can actually skip and procrastinate and go do something else 
when you come back, the work is just so much and it's, it's just overwhelming. So this is another problem that I think um, COVID-19 has brought. And then the third point is a lack of social activities. As young people, we love to go out, we love to socialize, and we love to take a breather here and there. And I feel um, with this pandemic being confined, it's quite difficult to feed your social energy. And it's much easier for you to feed negative energy and to feed off of emotional um, baggage. So I think a lot of us have been really struggling to stay on our own, especially extroverted people and those people who just um, kind of need to go out to actually enjoy um, company of others. And then fourthly, feelings of detachment and restlessness. I personally have experienced this during COVID-19. Um, first of all, it's the anxiety of being in a pandemic, the anxiety of knowing that, um, actually not knowing when it's going to end, you know, we all don't like unknowns. We want to know when is when are we going to press the stop button on this pandemic? When are we going to go back to how life has been? So we start feeling restless. We start feeling detached from the rest of the world. And that is when we just try to close ourselves in our rooms and drown ourselves in schoolwork, which is ultimately not healthy for anyone to do. And then the last point is low mental health, which is definitely a problem and which eventually leads to burnout. So with low mental health, we are faced with so many um, injustices to our emotions, to our physical being, and eventually to how we perform, eventually to how we interact with people. So again, I, am, I must say I'm really happy that there are so many discussions around mental health, um, particularly in this time and age. And we being alive in this time and age to see and to experience a pandemic has really been an experience. Um, one last thing that I think has really stood out with the COVID-19 pandemic in relation to burnout is that once a lecturer of ours actually said that this is the time to see who, who of you, which of the, the medical students is the strongest. And she went on to say that only those who can survive um, hard times such as this and, uh, and not, you know, give up and so on are the most equipped. And I feel like this was not, really um, good advice from my end, because it then actually encourages students to keep working, keep working, and not realizing that it's okay to say, I need to rest. It's okay to say, I'm in a pandemic. People are sick, people are dying. I can take a step back and I can breathe from schoolwork. Instead, it cultivates a, an energy for competition. It cultivates an energy for getting on top, getting recognition and so on which I still think are very negative for a study environment. And then on my last slide, I have stated that students are struggling because there is no incentive to take care of themselves. And even when we do have a supportive administration saying, take care of yourself, the larger culture of medicine is focused on sucking up and pushing through. This is as simple as it's stated. The university is really a space that encourages us to take care of ourselves. And every now and then we see mental health hashtags, mental health matters hashtags. We, we hear from our seniors how important it is to take care of yourself and to work hard. But that hidden picture of what is actually screaming the loudest is that you just need to push through, is that if somebody else made it, you too can make it regardless of what you have to go through, regardless of how much stress you have to endure, is that as the years go on, the stress increases. The pain of you know, feeling detached, the pain of feeling depressed will increase. And honestly, this is a narrative that we need to reverse and just take a step back and look at how we can actually um, encourage students to work hard and at the same time, preserve their mental health and care for themselves in a way that is holistically supportive of their emotional, physical, spiritual, and academic well-being. So with that said, um, this has been um, the end of my presentation. And thank you so much for tuning in. I will now revert back to Amanda, who will then um, deal with the questions and so on. Thank you so much. 
Wow, thank you. Thank you for such a great talk, Tulika. I, I think that we we all learned so much and student burnout is is such a, an important topic nowadays. And I feel like just what, what you said before, it was just everyone pushing through. And now lately has been a wave of mental health awareness and hashtags and everything. And do not do not ask too much about yourself. But it's also it's a balance between not asking too much about yourself and working hard. You know, it's not like you're going to be, it's just because it's a pandemic, you're going to be in bed all day forgetting about your, your life, you know, and at the same time, it's not because it's a pandemic and you're at home that you have to be more productive or anything. I, uh, I always say that balance is very dynamic. So in order for mm -hmm. you to exceed in some things, you're going to have to, not do other things and it's not doing both at the same time at your maximum because you have uh you have you're kind of like a battery you know and there is like a, a limit of how charged you, you can be and how energy you can put into into things I, mm -hmm. I also think that sometimes you will be needed uh like it will be needed from you to give a boost and work hard for something but at the same time it's just for a short period of time you can't do that for long you know is it is like you mentioned you you worked you study from early morning until late at night and you could do that for like a short period of time but over time that becomes that 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 piles up and you we, we are physically and mentally not able to deal with that much um Definitely. right it's it's you you have to know how to identify your triggers as well and know when to take a step back i i can also really because i've always been a person that um said that i would never do yoga and when this quarantine started <laughs> i started doing yoga and it helped me so much but lately <laughs> lately even i started kind of asking a lot of uh, for my for myself about yoga so like even now i have to say sometimes no to yoga because i i ask a lot from myself there you know so it's just knowing how to identify the triggers really and giving your mind a rest um i just wanted to point out that next week is self-care week so from the 16th mm -hmm. to the 22nd so um actually there's a society uh from anna harris who's in this webinar now uh and then next week they will be posting three self-care challenges so the the site is called we heal and they will be posting three self-care challenges next week and they are to write three positive things about yourself go outside for 10 minutes a day and meditate for mm -hmm. 60 minutes across the whole week so i would encourage everyone to you know to actually take those challenges which are not actually challenges they are gifts for yourselves and uh take self-care week for yourself as well um and that's why this talk today is so important i'm just gonna give you some uh, some of the questions that we had on the chat now so we had the first one from jane so she said to Ilika, how do you think a student experiencing burnout can bounce back to their academic life because in this bur burnout moment you just feel trapped how then does one bounce back all right, um, as I mentioned in my presentation, it's important that you learn to take a step back. As a medical student, we tend to be very competitive against ourselves and against others, but much more against ourselves and very unforgiving when we fall short to the goals that we've set out. So I feel like it's important that you take a step back and try to readjust, refocus, and realign yourself to why you started whatever you're doing. And also very important is to identify your triggers, as Amanda has said, because these are things that actually ignite you to feel so overwhelmed and feel so alone. So I think it's important that when you take a step back, you don't take a step back to go lie down on your bed on your phone. You don't take a step back to go socialize, but you take a step back to tune into yourself again. It's easy to say um, you need to toughen up just be strong and go ahead with it. But sometimes it's okay to break down. Sometimes it's okay to cry. It's okay to, you know, uh, journal all your feelings out or just call a friend and cry as much as you want. Talk to them about how you feel and express yourself. 
And I think that's why, again, mentorship is so important, having a mentor in med school, um, be it a senior, be it somebody not even in med school, you know, just somebody who is there to speak to, who you, who is there for you to speak to whenever you need somebody. So yeah, take a step back. Perfect. I love that. I honestly love that. I think it's uh, the mentor idea is also so important. So important that it's someone to give you support, you know, it's always, always, uh, and also to identify when you are not helping yourself, you know, so sometimes we, we get blinded as well by how much we're doing and we're, we don't like actually see our limits. So having someone by your side that actually knows you and knows how to give you support, that is very, very important. We actually had a question also from Matthew that said, mm -hmm. uh, as students is a long question and he, he also uh, apologizes for the long question. <laughs> But um, as students progress into clinical careers and working life, some of the key stresses for burnout have been identified as blame culture, targeting individual people for problems rather than system failures, and also toxic hierarchy, which is where intimidating senior personalities lead to stress for junior team members. Are these concepts also shared with healthcare professionals in Namibia and Zambia? Definitely. Um... I didn't start with my clinical practices yet, but I always hate from the seniors. Just yesterday, a friend of mine was complaining about how he's on the verge of quitting medical school. Not because it's such a terrible course, but because of the MOs and the supervisors who are so, so mean. And they just attack you for every single weakness. It's a thing of, you didn't even put on gloves. It's an issue. They start calling you stupid. They start calling you incompetent. So, I believe that this toxic hierarchy does exist in Namibia. I don't know about Zambia, but it is definitely something that we need to address. I don't think, okay, maybe what they want to do is to encourage students to be tough, encourage them not to be softies as doctors. I mean, you need to have some sense of resilience towards life, but also it's very downbreaking and it's very discouraging to know that every single thing you do seems to be wrong. And being in med school, you already feel like you're under so much pressure. So hearing it from somebody else just makes it so much worse. So yes, I think Phoenix should really organize a TED Talk that has lecturers on board and um, supervisors and MOs, just and students as well, just for us to share our views about how we feel about, you know, how we are treated in the clinical setting and in the hospital setting as well. Yeah, that's that's actually a great idea, you know. And Phoenix Med, it is. Uh, I I think we're all keen to take uh take take that idea forward in the future. Uh, that's perfect. And um, a last question. It's, what do you think about the phrase burnout? Is not about giving too much of yourself. It's about trying to give what you not possess. Yeah. Um, so you want to, me to um, say what I think about that concept? Yeah. Uh, um, I think when I hear the word burnout, in, you're trying to um, pull, out, pull out what you don't have. I relate it to existential. It's an existential emergency. Basically, what I mean by this is you are in a state of emergency and your existence is on the line. Your existence encompassing your social life, your financial life, your academic life, your spiritual life, and your emotional life. That's the thing about burnout. It comes as a package. It's not just your academics that are affected by it, but it's the way you perceive life now is also affected. The way you interact with other people is affected. And even the way you do, um, you know, in projects, the way you, you contribute now creatively to organizations and so on, everything is affected. So you try so hard to pour out of an empty cup. And if you don't take a step back and just try to, um, first of all, acknowledge that you are in that state of burnout, or at least speak to somebody about it, who can actually help you come to that conclusion that you're actually burning out, only then can you actually do something about it. But if you continue being in that position, you'll continue to spiral downwards and, the, ex the, the existential emergency will continue to actually vomit onto your life and onto the lives of others. So I think that's what I think about it in a nutshell. No, yeah, that's, uh, that's amazing, honestly. Um, and just to highlight as well how, 
how all of this has also been brought up in the conference that we had back in uh, September, September, uh, the Phoenix conference where we talked about mental health. Um, and also in Dr. Baptiste's talk that we had last month. And they both, they like, they both highlight how we should not ask too much of ourselves, you know. Um, actor Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Bat Baptiste said that if there was something that she would change about her career journey was to not ask too much about herself in the past. So it just highlights how our well-being is important. Guys, our well-being is important, okay? And um, I'm not sure about uh, this, the type of support that you have um, in Africa, but in Cardiff, we do have a lot of student support. And I don't think the university actually puts it that well, but well-being uh, support systems are available in Cardiff Uni. And if you ever need to talk to someone, uh, please do, okay? Please talk to your friends. Please use the, the support available to you. Phoenix MedEd also um, text us on any of our platforms and we're more than happy to help and support you because we really care about your well-being. Uh, and we also have the social events, which are a great way to kind of like relieve the, the stress on top of you. Just, you know, talk to people, collaborate internationally. Um, so I would highly encourage everyone to participate as well. As you, as you see from the chat, Gareth kindly put the, the Facebook link for We Heal. And that's the society that's uh, doing the self-care week challenges. So we would also highly encourage you to take a look at what they're doing. And, you know, really engage with next week, the self-care uh, week. So it's going to be great for everyone, I believe. And I just wanted to thank Tulika for today's talk. It's, it's been massively inspirational and at the same time, realistic. Um, and Amanda, can I ask you a question before we yeah. end? For sure, yeah. yeah. No, I just wanted to ask, um, from the image I've painted um, of our university here in Namibia, in terms of mental health activities and so on, what do you think are some of the differences that you in the UK actually have that you think we can actually implement or work on? Just, okay, what kind of activities do you have there that support student welfare and, and student uh, mental health? Well, um, basically we have support systems for, for well-being. So uh, before that, we in every society that we have here in Cardiff in the campus, there there is the concept of well-being officer being um, included in societies the, for the past uh, months. Especially. So the well-being officers are responsible for the, the well-being of the committee members. So every society that you are involved with, you can have an opportunity to actually go and talk to this well-being officer if you're having any, any kind of problems. We also have um, several um, student mentors that, for example, year, years above, they mentor years below and they provide also a support system for them. Uh, we also have the concept of in health in medicine of medic parents, which can also provide support to students uh, when they need, and it's kind of like their little family. So they some some of them really get close to each other and become lifelong friends, and that's another type of support. And we also have the academic support, which is um, all of the, uh, the the mental health. They also have the disclosure team if you have any uh, trouble with uh, not only mental health problems but if you have any problems with rape or racism or sexual assault or har harassment they're also there to help um so in the in, on the internet there's a range of support systems there there's available and i i i feel like that now more more than ever people are relying on each other for support so i feel like having mentors and having groups of people of societies or or um fellowships that actually include everyone and make sure everyone's listened to and support each other when they have problems i think that's very very important to have if anyone also wants to add anything anyone that's from cardiff uh, please feel welcome to do so either um unmute yourself or uh, write down on the chat um yeah. yeah and Matthew just mentioned that well-being is being more integrated into the curriculum in Cardiff also with specific sem seminars and group activities. So yeah, very, very important. And Gareth may, made also a, a final note on behalf of WeHeal. 
he, so he would like to set a self-care goal for the week ahead. So compliment one of your flatmates or housemates or friends at least once a day and take a mental note of how you feel after it. So I think that's also very, very good. Another challenge mm -hmm. for you guys there. Um, mm -hmm. Just another massive thank you to Lika. Like I, I, I really feel like this, this hour in this webinar made everyone think back about themselves a little bit and see um, the past, present and future and actually know that our well-being is important. I'm going to be posting um, a feedback form on this chat. So if you guys want to give us feedback, that would be massively helpful so that we can improve the quality of our future webinars and make it even better for you so that we can support you even more. Uh, Tulika, thank you so much again. For, for being with us today. Do you have any any final um, any final thoughts or or comments that you want to add? Yeah, um, perhaps in final thoughts, um, something that I forgot to mention is um, something I think Matthew stated. Matthew Lee, he said um, there are pro programs that focus on um, transition from lectures to clinical learning, and I feel like that is something that is missing also in our universities. On, during every stage of medical school, actually, it's not we, we are not allowed to actually take a step back and realize that this is where we are transitioning into. It just happens, boom, you're doing dissections, boom, you're going to the clinics, it, boom, you're in the hospitals. So I feel there should really be programs that help students um, to understand that the next phase is not the same as the first one. And there's some sort of resilience, which I spoke about the resilience curriculum that people can actually integrate into the universities um, that they need to build in order to thrive in that different environment. So, but anyways, in last words, um, I'm really grateful that I got the opportunity to speak on this platform. Um, I'm not very knowledgeable about um, certain topics, and most of it I've had to you know, ask from seniors how they have dealt with certain things, how their experiences were, but still using my voice on platforms such as this to spread um, awareness and educate and also be a vessel for um, change within the healthcare system is particularly very important to me. And I'm grateful for Phoenix for hosting these sessions for students between um, um, Kedrif, Namibia and Zambia. And I hope eventually we'll branch out to more schools and for more networks. I'm excited to meet you one day and I hope you can visit Namibia. Thank you. Oh, we really hope so too. Really, really want to meet you in real life, actually. Um, Matthew, actually, I wanted to say something as well. Um, are you there? Yep, I'm there. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Excellent. Um, apologies, my webcam would take a bit more work to get set up, but that was an excellent talk, Julika. Really, really enjoyed it. Um, I think everything that you said is very relevant to the preclinical years in particular, just the amount of workloads and the work in late nights and whatnot. I hope you don't mind. I'd just like to say a little bit on that transition into mm -hmm. the clinical years. So when we, um, when I was going through that transition, uh, mm -hmm. it was something that wasn't really addressed very well, that sort of concept of well-being and you were sort of almost expected to just get on with it um like you were off you go to placement um good luck sort of thing what then seems to have happened from there is um several of my colleagues started having a different sort of view on the working life so it's very textbook focused in um the pre-clinical years and then once you get into clinical years you encounter a whole range of different people. Um, and one thing that really got to me was the concept of just witnessing dying and witnessing death. Um, what we realized was there's a gap in our curriculum to introduce something that would help with this transition. So we set up a talk. This was purely student-led, student-focused, something that definitely would be achievable and replicable in Namibia and Zambia. Um, we proposed to the university to deliver a seminar, um, just a half hour seminar from myself and um, another colleague uh, about an experience that we witnessed from an emotional perspective 
um, when we were involved in a cardiac arrest and someone died. And we all we did was we talked about our emotions and our experience right at the start of the year below um, clinical placements. And the whole idea and concepts behind it was just to give students at the start of their clinical journey something that they could empath uh, empathize to, something they'd be able to relate to, and just to sort of share a little bit of community that we're all human and we all experience um, these emotions and no one actually is any harder or tougher than anyone else. When you see something difficult, it's going to be difficult regardless. Um, so I'm more than happy to share the details of what um, we implemented. Um, there's a lot of other work going on. Um, if anyone wants to get in touch, you're more than welcome to. That's perfect. And it's, yeah, very, very inspirational, Matthew. Honestly, I, I will, I, I'm personally going to contact you to uh, know more about this, <laughs> but also encourage everyone to do so. Yeah, please do share. Yeah, just to end this webinar. Mm -hmm. Uh, and thank you very much, Matthew, for the comments. And I, I really feel like it's very significant uh, what you and your colleague, your colleague did and then bringing that emotional aspect of it because I, I also mm -hmm. feel, especially being in preclinical years, I'm now in second year, um, that there is enough support in that aspect coming from the university. So very, very important. Um, if I can ask everyone now to use their reaction buttons and just give a huge round of applause to, to Ilika and also all of your contributions today. Uh, very, very thankful for everyone that attended. And this talk will also be on our Facebook page. So you can also rewatch, you know, whenever you need um, and also get more, even more ideas and brainstorm more, more things and get more insights from this talk. So it will be uploaded soon. And thank you very much to Ilika once again. Hope everyone has a great thank evening. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Good night.